vectors. If you clicked on this video, you probably already know what a vector is. However, regardless on your current level of knowledge about them, we were still going to quickly reintroduce them in a more genetic way. So, what is a vector? Technically, we could just give the definition of vector usually given in linear algebra courses by the vector space axioms, and we would be done. But before we do that, let's try to give some motivation behind the definition. So let's start by analyzing, etymologically speaking, what vector means. Vector comes from the Latin verb vehere, which can be translated as to carry, to move, or alternatively to advance. The word vector was used for the first time by William Rowan Hamilton in the context of quaternions, but vectors, in the particular case of arrows of two- and three-dimensional Euclidean space, have been known under different names since the times of Descartes. Hamilton conceived a vector as a difference of its two extreme points. For Hamilton, a vector was strictly a three-dimensional entity, having three coordinates relative to any given coordinate systems, and possibly both polar or rectangular or other coordinate systems. He therefore referred to vectors as triplets. In Hamilton's texts, furthermore, the first occurrences of the word scalar can also be found. This one derives from the Latin word scala, which means scale. In the modern sense, when we talk about scaling a vector, we mean scaling the length of a vector, and possibly reflecting it if we are multiplying it by a negative scalar. We have thus two operations that we can perform on vectors. We can sum them, and we can scale them by real value. And notice that scaling a vector by real value is nothing but a continuous extrapolation of the discrete operation of summing a vector n times by itself. Now we have our three-dimensional vectors, which are three-dimensional arrows in our space. And now we can sum them geometrically by taking the first vector of the sum and positioning the start of the latter with the tip of the other vector and then drawing the vector that goes from the start of the second vector to the tip of the vector we moved. And we can scale them, as we said, by basically we can think of stretching or compressing our vector by a certain scale or and by multiplying it by a negative value we would result in a in a reflected vector. So now, in order to prove some facts about these operations, we will treat them analytically. And we see that if we write our three-dimensional arrows as triplets, where the three values represent the distance on the x, y, and z axis with respect to the origin, then we can express analytically the operations that we introduced geometrically before in the following way. So now, let's prove that the sum is commutative, associative, and also has an inverse and an identity. So by the way we defined it, it is pretty easy to prove it in this particular case, but in the more general case, whenever we define an operation like that, so we take a structure which has an already well-behaved enough operation, and we define couplets or possibly n-tuples of, from va of values from that structure, and then we define a component-wise operation between these tuples, then we will get another well-behaved structure. So in more formal terms, in this case, we're talking about groups. And well, since R, so the real numbers, with respect to addition is a group, this, this means that real addition is commutative, associative, it has an identity, which is zero, and every element has an inverse. And well, what we, the construction we did earlier for our triplets was nothing but basically taking triplets of real values and then defining some of these triplets by component-wise sum. And this is in, this in algebra is called an external direct product of groups. And it is a pretty well-known fact that it turns out that external direct product of groups are still groups. Now we're going to prove that the scalar multiplication that we defined distributes with respect to the addition of real numbers. Now, on the other hand, we're going to prove that scalar multiplication distributes with respect to vector addition. Furthermore, if we multiply a vector by the scalar 1, which is the ident multiplicative identity of our real numbers with respect to real number multiplication, we get back the original vector. Furthermore, we want to show that scalar multiplication, that is the multiplication of a real value by a vector, is compatible with multiplication of real numbers. Now, these properties are precisely the properties that we postulate a vector space to obey when we study them in linear algebra. 
The reason why we pick these as a representative over others might not be entirely clear, and it's fine since there is quite a lot of heuristics involved in the process. This formulation of abstract vector spaces, which is the way in which they are presented in linear algebra textbooks, was first introduced by the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Peano in his paper Calcolo Geometrico Secondo Lausdenungslehre di H. Grassmann. As the title suggests, this paper was in turn deeply influenced by Grassmann's work, in particular his paper Die lineale Ausdenungslehre, Ein neuer Zweig der Mathematik, where Grassmann introduced notions such as that of linear independence and dimension. The power for formalism of vector spaces and linear algebra was thus formulated as a consequence of the observation that there are far more general and abstract objects that behave like arrows in space. This formalism was thus intuitively induced and heuristically motivated by geometry, and so we can see this as a one-way bridge from geometrical intuition to abstract mathematical structures. However, it turns out that we can construct the bridge the other way around too. Abstract vector spaces are an incredibly powerful tool that allows us to solve many geometric problems. We can define a notion of inner product that allows us to measure lengths and angles in our space. We can export this ability on a local level by doing it on the tangent space of a manifold. This leads to the concept of a Riemannian manifold. We can use quadratic forms and their associated matrices to study and classify conic sections, quadratic surfaces and quadratic hypersurfaces. And really, much more can be done, but to not make this video too long, we'll stop here. It is thus evident how vector spaces form the algebraic setting for Euclidean geometry. We now wonder if there's an analogous construction for hyperbolic geometry, also known as Labachevskian geometry. The answer to this question is affirmative, and the structure in question is known in literature with the name of Giro vector space. Giro vector spaces not only form the hyperbolic equivalent of vector spaces for the study of hyperbolic geometry, but also have important connections with many areas of physics, most importantly, Thomas' precession and the velocity addition law in special theory of relativity. Before we dive into the details of Giro vector spaces, let's first talk about hyperbolic geometry. What is hyperbolic geometry? Euclidean geometry, which is the usual geometry we're all accustomed to, has some axioms in order to be treated as an abstract model. These axioms are contained in Euclid's element, even though in most modern books Hilbert's axioms are reported. One axiom in particular tormented mathematicians for centuries, and that is the Euclid's fifth postulate, also known as the parallel postulate that states that in the plane, given a line and a point not in it, at most one line parallel to the given line can be drawn through the point. And note that this is not precisely Euclid's original postulate, but rather an equivalent one commonly known as Playfair's axiom. Ever since the time of Euclid, mathematicians felt like it was an unnatural postulate and wanted to show that it could be proven starting from the others. However, all these attempts were not successful. This fifth axiom tormented one mathematician more than the others, Janos Boliai. Boliai's obsession with the latter is shown by the following letter that his father wrote to him. You must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to the very end. I have traversed this bottomless night, which extinguished all light and joy in my life. I entreat you, leave the signs of parallels alone. Boliai, however, did not surrender, and in 1823 he came to the conclusion that the fifth postulate is independent of the others. His works were published in 1832. Independent from Boliai, the Russian mathematician Nikolai Ivanovich Labachevsky came to similar conclusions. They independently pioneered the development of non-Euclidean geometry, and this is the reason why we often call hyperbolic geometry labachevsky balyai geometry. Hyperbolic geometry is not the only kind of non-Euclidean geometry, but for this video we will focus on this one. As we said earlier, hyperbolic geometry does not respect Playfair's axiom. This leads to many counterintuitive results. The first one of them is that in hyperbolic geometry, the sum of the angles in a triangle may be less than 180 degrees, and furthermore, given a line, there exists an infinite number of lines parallel to it through a point not on the line. Mathematically speaking, hyperbolic space is a Riemannian manifold of constant sectional curvature equal to minus 1. A Riemannian manifold can be intuitively understood as a space which locally resembles Rn, and where we can locally measure lengths and angles. There are various models of hyperbolic geometry, all equivalent to each other. The hyperboloid model, the Beltrami Klein model, the Poincaré ball model, and the Poincaré half space model. For the purposes of this video, we will focus on Poincaré's model and the Beltrami Klein model. The Poincaré disk model is a model of two dimensional hyperbolic geometry in which all points are inside the unit disk. In geodesics, that is, curves that minimize distance, are either circular arcs contained within the disk that are orthogonal to the unit circle or diameters of the unit circle. 
the way in which we measure distances inside our disk is also different. The hyperbolic distance between two points on the disk is given by the following formula. If this formula seems nonsensical, it's fine. A derivation of it starts from the metric with which our Poincaré disk model being a Riemannian manifold is endowed with. In the future, I'll make a video solely devoted to the Poincaré disk, in which I will include also this derivation. We are now ready to dive into the heuristics of gyrovector spaces. Eurovector spaces were introduced in 1988 by Abraham Albert Unger as an attempt to create a notion analogous to that of an Euclidean vector space in the case of hyperbolic geometry. In particular, we will be interested in two kinds of Eurovector spaces. That is, Mobius Eurovector spaces, which will serve as an algebraic setting for the Poincaré disk model, and Einstein Eurovector spaces, which serve, on the other hand, as a setting for the Beltrami Klein model. So, back to Eurovector spaces. Let's see how the idea developed genetically. The discovery of zero groups in zero vector spaces was, was gradual. They emerged from the non-commutative, non-associative algebraic structure of three-dimensional relativistically admissible velocities, with operation given by the relativistic velocity composition. Ungar, in his paper, The Relativistic Non-Commutative Non-Associative Group of Velocities and the Thomas Rotation, exposed how the previously cited operation satisfies a weak commutative and weak associative law, and he expressed them in terms of the Thomas Rotation. But what is the Thomas Rotation? Both of these concepts are named after the physicist Llewellyn Thomas, who noticed that, in general, two successive Lorentz acceleration transformations do not form a Lorentz acceleration transformation, but rather a Lorentz acceleration transformation preceded or followed by space rotation. The latter is now commonly known with the name of Thomas rotation. This fact was also noticed independently by the Polish physicist Ludwig Silberstein in his 1914 textbook The Theory of Relativity. The following set represents in the special theory of relativity the set of admissible velocities. The relativistic ve velocity composition law is given by the following equation, which as you can see is radically different from the velocity composition in classical physics, which is a just a vector addition. The necessity for such a, an expression is due to the fact that we, that we require that by combining relativistically acceptable velocities, we need to get back another relativistically possible velocity. In fact, if we took the set of relativistically admissible velocities and sum them with respect to the classical addition of vectors, the algebraic structure that we will get would not be closed, because trivially we will be able to get velocities faster than light by summing velocities that are not. Here, gamma is the Lorentz factor, which is pretty frequent in special relativity. By the definition of velocity composition and admissible velocities we gave, we see that when we composed a velocity u with a velocity v and a velocity v with u, we see that composing u with v is different than composing v with u. So the composition that we define is generally non-commutative. However, we see that the two have the same magnitude. From th for this reason, we can then construct a unique rotation operator that we will denote as tom of u and v that is able to quote-unquote fix the non-commutativity of our algebraic structure with the following relation. Geometrically, this weak commutativity can be seen as an action of our rotation operator, TOM, by aligning these two different elements with the same magnitude, one over another via a rotation. This is the expression for this operator, and as we can see, is quite convoluted. Now, the following properties hold. Now, at this point you might say, okay, so we found an operator which, which quote-unquote fixes non-commutativity by defining it ad hoc. So what? Well, it turns out that Thomas rotation not only fixes the non-commutativity of our loop of, of possible velocities, but it also fixes its non-associativity. In his 1988 paper, Ungar realized that the Thomas rotation, which is usually studied as an isolated concept with respect to the velocity composition, is actually an integral part of the algebraic structure of our C. This operator, which quote-unquote fixed non-commutativity and non-associativity in our loop of relativistically possible velocities, can then be generalized, giving rise to the notion of gyration and the abstract notion of zero group. Thus, just like we did with Euclidean vector spaces, we took our intuition from physics and geometry, and then we abstracted our initial structure, in the first case arrows, in the second case relativistically admissible velocities, into a more abstract model. This is the way in which zero groups were discovered. However, let's now provide another and probably better way to, way to introduce them. Let's consider the complex unit disk D. We know that the complex unit disk with the Poincaré metric is a model of hyperbolic geometry 
known as the Poincaré disk. The most general Mobius self-transformation of the unit disk assumes the following form. Now, if you're not comfortable with the notion of Mobius transformation, I will leave some resources in the description so that you can read more about it. And, but for now, keep in mind that Mobius transformations are conformal maps, and furthermore, Mobius transformations play a fundamental role in complex geometry. This expression gives rise to what we could call Mobius addition, which can be geometrically interpreted as an hyperbolic translation. This addition is neither commutative nor associative. And now we will actually check it. However, inspired in the way in which we introduced the Thomas rotation operator in the case of Einstein velocity addition, we will introduce an operator which we will call gyration and define it in the following way. Our gyration, like before, repairs associativity and commutativity laws alike. This leads to the definition of a zero group. We can also define zero commutative zero groups. Now notice that our, the set of axioms that we provided is in a certain sense quite minimalistic. As you can see, we did not suppose that our identity was unique, and we only supposed that we had a left identity. In the same way, we only supposed that we had a left inverse, and we did not suppose that this left inverse was unique. We did this because we can actually derive from these axioms that indeed the left inverse must also, must also be the right inverse, and furthermore, it must be unique. And in the same way, the identity must be unique and it must be both the left and right identity. Now, just like abelian groups with extra structure lead to the definition of a vector space, we can add extra structure in a zero commutative zero group to create the notion of a zero vector space for hyperbolic space. Now, the only missing piece that we need in order to make the unit disk in complex plane a zero vector space, as well as the set of relativistically admissible velocities, is the concept of zero scalar multiplication that we also define in our axioms for zero vector space. But the way in which we do it is precisely in the same way in which we did it for Euclidean geometry. In particular, we take the discrete operation of summing, of actually in this case, zero summing, a, an element of, for example, the a relativistically admissible velocity, in one case for the Einstein zero vector space, or a point in the unit disk for the case of the Mobius zero vector space, of what will become the Mobius zero vector space, then by summing itself n times, we get a formula. And notice that this notion is unambiguous, but of course the operation of addition uh, of, of our loop of an element with itself is trivially both associative and commutative. Now we will get an expression in terms of a discrete number, so in particular of a positive integer n. Now if we formally substitute this positive integer n with a real value, then we get formula for, for zero scalar multiplication in our zero vector spaces. At this point, we're done with the introduction of these concepts, but notice that we're only scraping the surface. In fact, there is much more to say about zero vector spaces and zero groups, in particular about their applications to zero trigonometry. And for this, I will leave some resources in the description. And possibly, in the future, I might also make a continuation of this video in, in which we will explore these applications. With this said, I thank you for your attention and hope that this video was helpful.